Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So I um, previously to this put up a video where I talked briefly about the um, Afghan um, chara or chura as it's called and the kyber knife and um, this one of the characteristic features of this as uh, featured in Forged in Fire, one of the recent episodes that I watched, um, is the T-section blade and I also drew a comparison with the, grabbing it again, the Pesh Cabs. Now it's clear that the Pesh Cabs is a stabbing weapon, but as I mentioned in my previous video, the Chura or Chara is um, predominantly a cutting weapon, or is it? Well, the evidence of the 19th century, um, from the 19th century of British writers is certainly that the Kyber knife was predominantly used as a chopping weapon. So we would therefore ask, um, why did it have a T-section blade? Well, some people have asserted that this is to add to the stiffness of the blade for depth of penetration through um, kind of thick clothing, maybe poshtines, which are type of um, sheepskins that they wore in Afghanistan to keep warm in winter, or indeed through armor. Um, but um, as I've highlighted in previous videos, a couple of previous videos actually, the, the chara or chura was predominantly used to cut. So therefore that doesn't really, add, doesn't really support that argument. You know, why would you need this um, stiffened T-section blade for thrusting if this blade was predominantly used to cut. Well, someone made a very good point um, underneath one of my videos, and it shows that you guys have been paying attention. Absolutely, um, as I mentioned, you can't assume that a weapon was used a certain way just from looking at its shape, but there's another level to that. You can't assume that the way a weapon was predominantly used was the way that it was intended to be used. So it gets even more complicated. And certainly when we're looking, as I mentioned, when we're looking at um, experimental archeology span and anthropology, if we're looking at bronze Hewitt Park leaf shaped blades, or if we're looking at um, Roman Mainz gladiuses or things like this, the fact is we don't have any technical treatises. Once we get into the 15th and 16th and later centuries, we have actual treatises telling us how these weapons should be used. But we don't really have that. With some detail, you know, with the Roman period, we've got Vegetius and we've got little bits and pieces of Tacitus and other things, um, or Tacitus, I'm not really sure how it's supposed to be said in Latin. Um, but we've got some Roman sources which talk a little bit about weapon use, but they're not really, we don't have any treatises. We don't have a treatise of Roman sword and shield, for example. We have to just kind of make up the techniques based on artistic representations, textual descriptions, archeological evidence, and the weapons themselves. But there are many, many pitfalls because as I've mentioned many times, just because a weapon's a certain shape and weight and balance doesn't mean that it was necessarily used predominantly in the most logical way. This being a really good example of that, it wasn't used in the way that you might, you know, you look at the tapering pointy shape and the T-section blade, you think it's a thrusting sword. Well, as we found out from 19th century sources, and not just one, uh, I mentioned this, you know, the, the British surgeon, military surgeon writing to a 19th century, but actually there's many 19th century sources that point out that these were used in Afghanistan to cut. But we also have to remember, as mentioned just a second ago, that just because they were predominantly used to cut doesn't mean that they were supposed to be predominantly used to cut. And someone made a very good point underneath my previous video of saying, you know, the majority of Afghan soldiers in the 19th century would have been essentially farmer levies. Um, they would have been um, pretty much like in medieval Europe when you have kind of like peasant levies. It would have been the same kind of thing in 19th century um, Afghanistan. Now that's not to say they didn't have a standing army. In actual fact, throughout most of the 19th century in Afghanistan, they did have standing armies. And actually the standing armies were relatively well equipped and equipped in a fairly um, kind of up-to-date European manner. They had muskets and bayonets and they wore uniforms. Actually in the late 19th century, there was a sort of royal bodyguard um, of Afghan soldiers who dressed somewhat like Scottish Highlanders. Um, and this was um, because the rulers of Afghanistan were so impressed with the Highlanders regiments of the British Army that they emulated tartan pattern uniforms uh, for their own uh, sort of guards. So they did actually have kind of like Western style um, kind of soldiery. But in addition to that, they also had these massive kind of peasant levies who were armed 
kind of, well, I won't say randomly, but they, 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 with their traditional tribal cultural weapons, usually a Jezail um, or some other form of um, matchlock firearm, occasionally flintlock firearm, um, sometimes pistols, sometimes a sword, usually a pulwar, sometimes a tulwar, uh, where's a tulwar, there we go, or there, um, and uh, sometimes a trawler, sometimes a pesh cab. So these were the common weapons in Afghanistan, as I've spoken about in previous videos. But just because these common Afghan soldiers, as all of these British sources say, you know, they'd come tearing down under the hills and they would chop with these kyber knives really fearsomely and like give really, you know, really nasty wounds to their opponents. And their opponents were many different people. They fought, the Afghans in the 19th century fought against Persia. They fought against the Persian Empire. Um, on their sort of uh, western border, I suppose western and southern border. They fought against the uh, Gurkhas and the Indians, so the Nepalese and the Indians. They fought against the British. They fought against Indian soldiers under British command. So uh, they fought against the Russians. So they had all sorts of opponents. Um, and, you know, famously Afghanistan is a kind of battle, has been a battlefield for many, many centuries, going back to Alexander the Great. In fact, before that. Um, so absolutely the common peasant lev levies indeed because most reports say that they slashed with their weapons it doesn't mean that the weapon was necessarily designed like that and there's an interesting comparison if we go back to the Roman gladius here. The Roman gladius very clearly can cut and can cut well but we have various Roman sources most famously Vegetius telling us that soldiers were taught to use the points of their swords. Now that in itself implies that they could have used their edges and many of them did use their edges. So it, it tells us all sorts of things in one sentence that tells us that you know it is quite natural for people to want to cut with weapons and to actually to get them to stab sometimes you have to train them to do that. So it is entirely plausible and possible that people using these uh, churas or charas were supposed to stab with their weapons more than cut. That is absolutely um, the case, and that is absolutely true. So, absolutely, we could say that the, the fact that the chura or chara doesn't seem to be necessarily uh, optimised for cutting and that it's got a T-section blade and a tapering blade, it is possible that the way that it was predominantly used wasn't the way that it was originally intended or designed or invented to be used. That's one thing. The second thing I want to mention is if it was indeed to be supposed to be a cutting weapon, a predominantly cutting weapon, why would you have a T-section at the back? Well, first thing I'll say is, generally speaking, a stiff blade is more forgiving in the cut. So if you have a lozen shape or a diamond, uh, flattened diamond section blade, um, frank frankly, like, you know, something like this French um, sword behind me, if the blade's got flexibility to it, if you don't get your edge alignment absolutely right, then when you hit the target, what can happen is the blade will bend and further exaggerate that misalignment of the edge and you'll hit flat. If you watch the um, TV series Forged in Fire, which as you know I do, you can actually see Doug Makeda cutting with certain types of straight sword and uh, straight long bladed swords that have quite flexible blades, for example the Claymore episode, where you can see this exact thing happens. He actually messes up his edge alignment very slightly and the fact that the blade is relatively narrow and we're relatively flexible, it, it exaggerates, it, it, it kind of magnifies his error and completely mucks up the cut and in one case it bent the blade and in another case it snapped the blade. If the blade is stiffer, like a katana for example, or indeed like um, curved blades because they, they flex less generally speaking curved blades, um, if the blade's broader, curved or thicker like a katana and, and doesn't flex and doesn't bend so much then actually it's more forgiving. So. The stiffness of the blade here could potentially make the blade better at cutting by being more forgiving. The second point is that for a given mass, what it means is you're creating the stiffness and adding mass to the blade essentially at the back. And what you're doing with the whole rest of the front of the blade is making it thinner and flatter. So therefore it's 
a finer edge or a, a, you're going to get meet less resistance when entering a, a target whether that's a person or anything else quite simply you're making a blade which is thinner where it'll enter the, enter the target more easily and you can put a very sharp edge on but not making the blade floppy and thin and weak because you're keeping this stiffening section at the back so that could be one possible reason but it has to be pointed out just as was found with British military swords which had a so-called pipe back blade which is somewhat similar to this and has a rib at the back the problem is when you're passing through a target there comes a certain point at which the material or meat or whatever you're passing through bone um, hits that rib at the back and prevents the cut from going any deeper or at least um, kind of makes it more difficult for it to pass through. So to conclude, it is entirely possible that the Kyber knife was designed for a purpose which it wasn't subsequently used for, or, or rather that the people who ended up predominantly using the Chora didn't use it in the way that it was originally imagined it was going to be used. It could be that in the original, in, in the I think probably about the 17th century when these were first becoming common in Afghanistan and parts of northern India, it could be that they were indeed predominantly stabbing weapons. We don't really know. Um, but it could just be that people being the way that they are, it's more natural to cut, and also the fact that these peasant levies are less likely to be trained in swordsmanship, they're more likely to just fight in more of a natural way. Uh, it could be that they didn't use them how they were intended, or it could be that in fact, yes, these design features were designed to, 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 for, for a cutting weapon and to, to give it a good sharp cutting edge. We just really don't know. But anyway, I hope that's somewhat interesting and gives you some things to think about and consider. Um, it is an interesting weapon, the Kyber knife or Chura, Chara, for many, many reasons. And one of the reasons undoubtedly is because it raises questions about other weapons in ancient cultures where we don't have descriptive accounts really, not detailed ones of how those weapons were used and so this is an interesting comparison in anthropological methodology cheers folks thank you for watching please subscribe and feel free to follow us on facebook